Hey guys, sorry for the long wait. So now we have um, Jameson Lop, co-founder and CTO of Casa, who's going to be talking about the state of hardware device ecosystem. Please welcome Jameson on stage. For all yours. As we are uh, handling support issues with our product. So we'll start off at the beginning here. The history of hardware devices, why do they exist? Well, obviously, we want to take the keys offline. We want uh, hackers to no longer be able to just compromise our computer and steal all of our money. And these hardware devices also greatly diminish the size of the attack surface by getting the keys off of a more complex operating system. These Generic operating systems that are widely used, like Windows, OS X, Linux, iOS, whatever, they're incredibly complicated because they are uh, generalized to be able to support almost any type of computation you can think of. And they're so complex that basically nobody has the ability to verify uh, everything that they're doing. So if we can instead get the important parts of key management off of these complex systems and get them into a very simple and easy to audit uh, piece of hardware, then we will greatly improve our ability to verify the security and the uh, real threat model that these hardware devices are able to provide to us. Now, at CASA, we actually further minimize the attack surface by blending brands, you know, different manufacturers' hardware together so that we no longer have a single point of failure, even if there is an issue with any one manufacturer. And one thing that I'd like to touch on is that I actually don't really use the term hardware wallet anymore, because as a wallet developer myself, I consider a wallet to be a much more full-featured piece of software that is doing things like UTXO management, actually you know, keeping track of your balances, deciding what UTXOs to spend, Etc. Whereas these hardware devices do not know anything about UTXOs. They are purely used to manage keys and to sign data that is provided to them. So hardware devices have been around for about six years. Uh, in 2014, we ha had Trezor uh, launch their first product, uh, I think in January or February, and then shortly thereafter, Ledger came through with what I believe the HW.1 device. And uh, there are a number of other manufacturers that aren't on here, but really these are probably the most popular. 2017, Shift Crypto came out with Bitbox, 2018, CoinKite came out with cold card and the you know, number of companies in the system is continuing to increase. But what are the real commonalities that we see between these devices? Well, generally you're going to see a screen and you're going to see some type of hardware buttons. And the screen is actually incredibly important. You may notice the bottom left, the Bitbox 01. Uh, is actually similar to the Ledger HW1 and then it doesn't have a screen. That's actually a major point of failure because it means you're blindly signing data. The screen is important because it allows the hardware device to parse the transaction and then display the various details like the value being moved, the addresses being uh, spent from and to, and really allowing the user to verify on standalone hardware that whatever their wallet software is telling them is actually the truth. So the screen is incredibly important. The other commonality that pretty much all of them have is that they are USB based, which means you're plugging a USB cord into some other computing device, whether it's a, a computer, desktop, laptop, possibly even mobile phone. And so the data transfer for most of these things happens over USB. Uh, one exception, of course, is cold card, which has true air gap operation. You can do the data transfer via SD card. Uh, Ledger X also has Bluetooth. That's kind of a one-off, though. I'm not really familiar with many wallet software supporting uh, Bluetooth and Ledger X. Now, it's important to note the hardware ecosystem is very young. And in fact, in the first four years or so, we did not see much along the lines of vulnerabilities getting reported. 
But in 2017, it seems that really ramped up the stakes and really ramped up the level of security experts who were starting to test these devices. So right now, we're kind of in an interesting phase where there are a lot of vulnerabilities that are still being discovered and disclosed on a regular basis. So I would say we're still quite a ways away from being in the position where we feel relatively comfortable that there are no unknown major vulnerabilities in uh, the various hardware that's being developed. Now, here's a number of different aspects by which you could judge a hardware device. There are probably several others that I've left out, and hopefully I didn't make any mistakes here. Uh, these are kind of highly uh, high-level uh trade-offs that you might see between the different devices, whether it's open source, more auditable. Uh, really, the reason why you see so much red here for Ledger is because of their very uh, specific decision not to use a secure element. There's a lot of trade-offs there uh, between open source auditability versus actual physical security uh, of the keys and how they're managed. Uh, the trade-offs that you get though are that if you don't have a secure element you can't have a true random number generator and um, that is also why you see this known exploit uh, role right here where i'm specifically referring to a known uh, physical key extraction exploit that is as, as far as we're aware never been actually pulled off outside of lab conditions but theoretically it could be done with about a hundred dollars worth of hardware and physical access uh, there are, of course, trade-offs and things that you can do to mitigate that, like using passphrases. Um, but that's a much more complex and nuanced discussion uh, that we could get into. Uh, also, one of the main reasons that I added the complex transactions uh, issue at the bottom is because cold card does really well on pretty much everything. And uh, I, I finally managed to find something that cold card does not do as well uh, as a lot of the other hardware devices on the market. This is actually the results of a bit of research I've been doing all year and just published a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so you can check that out on the CASA blog if you want to see what complex transaction support really means. Now, getting a little further along with platform support, you know, these devices do not generally operate on their own. You are plugging them into some other computer that's running some other operating system. You have to have, in many cases, specific USB libraries installed. For Linux, you may have to configure various rules to allow the USB device to work in the first place. If you're doing uh, browser-based signing, then there are compatibility issues you may have with web USB or HID um, you know, the communication uh, layer that's essentially used to talk to the USB devices. Some of the worst browsers will only actually say that you plugged in a uh, FIDO U2F type of uh, device. It won't even know that it is a you know, hardware key manager. It'll think it's just some sort of two-factor authentication device. There's, of course, also the issue of PSBT support, which generally I think that Cold Card and Kobo Vault are the only ones that support it at this time. But one of the interesting things that we've really learned over the past year once CASA added cold card support is that having true air-gapped operation is not only a cool security feature, but it is actually really good for usability. The user experience of doing an air-gapped data transfer, while it can be a little bit more onerous because you're having to transfer it you know, via perhaps a micro SD card, what you're doing there is you're actually able to bypass all of these other complexities with operating systems and browsers and USB drivers and whatever. So the, the short version is it's actually a lot more reliable if we're looking across the like, diversity of different computing devices and what people might be trying to use these hardware devices with. So in particular, one thing I haven't talked about is mobile systems. If you're running an Android phone, Android generally allows you to plug in things via USB and have the phone operating system directly talk to them. So you can actually use a Trezor or a Ledger to plug into your Android phone and sign transactions you know, if the app has added support for it. However, good luck doing that with uh, iPhone. 
the Apple ecosystem is pretty locked down, and they don't let you have just arbitrary USB devices plug in and talk to your apps. So the interesting thing that we've also discovered is that, once again, Cold Card actually comes out a winner when it comes to iOS support because we can just plug in the micro SD card with an adapter and the iPhone will mount that just as a regular data drive. And then all you're doing is doing a simple file transfer. And the actual signing, of course, is happening standalone on the code card. So getting even deeper into some issues of derivation support, uh, which you may or may not understand you know, what's going on under the scenes, like when you're actually creating private keys. Um, these devices, they are using entropy generally that is uh, provided by a random number generator on the device to create the seed. And the seed is then used to deterministically generate an almost unlimited number of public and private key pairs. And that is what results in you creating your addresses that you can use to deposit funds into that set of keys. Now, an interesting thing about the derivation paths is that while hardware devices have made it really hard for an attacker to steal your keys from you, there are some theoretical attacks where the attacker could trick you into sending your money to yourself, but in a way that you don't even know how to access it anymore. So there are these theoretical ransom attacks that, once again, I do not believe have actually been pulled off in real life, where the attacker could get you to send your money in a way that you lose it and then could essentially ransom you uh, for to, to get the data required to spend your money, basically asking you to like split your money with them. There's also issues of unhardened versus hardened paths, which gets into some real minutia around security and uh, privacy. In general, there was an issue with unhardened path derivation where if an attacker got one private key and they got the extended public key of a certain part of your uh, derivation, then they could theoretically derive the rest of those keys. In my opinion, this is much less of an issue now that people are managing their keys on these hardware devices, so that generally, I think it's a fairly safe assumption to say that if an attacker got one of your private keys that you're managing with the hardware device, they probably already have all of the other ones already. So this is not really something that I worry about myself. Uh, we've also got some issues with forcing some standards in the ecosystem, which I'll touch on in a second. And kind of similar to the ransom attack stuff, the change address validation, the Change address validation on these devices can get tricky, especially if you're using uh, less commonly used paths. And um, essentially, it can result in a poor user experience where the device makes it look like uh, your, your money is not actually going back to yourself or it's not sure whether that's happening. Probably hard to read some of this, but just trying to put up a general uh, idea that in these devices, they are using a variety of different derivation standards, and in many cases, they allow completely custom uses of derivation paths. So I, I don't think that these devices should be thought of as sort of standalone things anymore, but rather that we're creating an ecosystem where these hardware devices are a platform, and we do need to understand that they may be used for a variety of different things. We shouldn't try to shoehorn specific use cases in. So this is actually an issue that I opened with Trezor back in June, where we discovered a Trezor firmware update actually broke compatibility with CASA because of the derivation pass that we were using. And this is an interesting bit of conflict because historically, hardware device manufacturers have actually built full-stack solutions where they provide not only the hardware device, but also the wallet software and, and often the back-end infrastructure that is managing um, balance and, and transaction and UTXO lookups as well. So this was a decision that was made by Trezor because they wanted to further compartmentalize and sandbox some of their own Bitcoin apps. But the unfortunate side effect is that it broke... Other, uh, the other companies that were using their device as a platform. So CASA, I think it also broke Green Address 
And there may have been others that it broke that we just didn't know, you know, didn't chime in on this particular case. So it's an interesting point of contention, which I hope does not become a trend in this space because it will um, potentially cause issues with you know, using, ha being able to support multiple different hardware devices on any given platform if they don't all support the same type of derivation. So getting to the complex transaction stuff, this is the results of uh, a lot of testing that I did manually recently. If you're doing a happy use case, you know, spending a couple of UTXOs type of transaction, it'll probably work just fine with any of these devices. But if you're getting to the edge of what is considered a valid Bitcoin transaction, if you have many, many UTXOs, perhaps because you've been receiving money from a BTC pay server type merchant setup or because you've been dollar cost averaging for a long time, then what you find is these hardware devices can often struggle to deal with large amounts of data. You might get a PSBT is too big error. You might get uh, some sort of like random session interrupted error or timeout uh, from Trezor. Uh, on the ledger side, what I found is that often the ledger device will just hang for uh, 10 or 20 minutes before finally giving some sort of obscure read error. So. There's definitely still a lot of improvements that can be made by these hardware device manufacturers to make sure that they handle the edge cases of Bitcoin transaction signing. And um, in general, I'm sure that this is a um, this is a challenge for them to do because these are fairly low powered devices. And uh, sort of to give you an example of like, I did a 15 or 15 100 input transaction on a laptop recently, and it took three seconds. Whereas on most of these devices, they would take tens of minutes, if not to take, uh, you know, completely fail while trying to assign the transaction. So where's this all going? Well, I think that what we're going to see happen is more types of devices come out. We're going to see some do-it-yourself hardware. This is Spectre DIY, which I'm keeping an eye on. Uh, this will probably you know, remain fairly limited to niche technical folks because it will require some assembly at home. But it's interesting because this gets rid of more supply chain risks if you're just ordering generic computing parts uh, rather than specific security hardware. Um, we will also see an interesting trend on the QR side. I think QR code-based data transfer is going to be similar to the improvements in air-gapped file transfer where we can get rid of a lot of the complexities and make this stuff uh, a lot more user-friendly by not having to worry about what operating system people are using. Just completely bypass uh, computers in general. There's a couple of devices on the market that already support that and a couple more that will be coming out soon. And finally, one interesting throwback to Case Wallet, uh, which I reviewed in 2015. I felt like it was really ahead of its time. It had 2G network built in. It had a camera that worked really well. Uh, it even had a biometric fingerprint scanner. Uh, Multisig is also built into it. It even had uh, inductive charging that uh, made it really easy for you to, to keep powered. And of course, it had a discrete form factor, and it looked like a uh, calculator, much like the cold card does. Unfortunately, even though I felt like it was really well designed, the uh, trade-offs that they made with the 2G meant that it actually did not work very well, like it was supposed to. And the uh, biometric you know, fingerprint scanner, unfortunately, was not user-friendly at all. So... I think that you know there's still a lot of improvements that can be made, and we're going to continue, I think, seeing the sort of cat and mouse game on the security and usability side in the hardware space. And uh, I'll keep stress testing these things as they come out, and hopefully we'll all be able to continue moving forward and getting better and better hardware to the point that we no longer really have to worry about various edge cases where it might fail on us. So thanks for listening. I think of uh, pretty much use up all of my time.